Hello everyone, I'm Ian Waterhouse and welcome to Barking Mad. Yes, the official podcast of the British Automobile Racing Club. It's episode 10, episode 10 already. But of course, before we dive into it all, it's only right that I should introduce my Barking Mad co-host and Barking Mad he is indeed. It's only Alan Hyde. Alan, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, Ian. Thank you very much indeed. I like it when you intro me in that way and I enjoy introing you in that way. So um, this is all working well. 10 episodes. 10 double figures yeah i thought you'd have been sick of my face by now <laughs> no far from it i'm enjoying every single one of these it's really good and it's great uh, when people are coming up at the race meetings that i'm attending as well to say that they're enjoying yeah. the podcast it's um, it's going far and wide isn't it it certainly is and talking of being at the racetrack where have you been alan because you've been a busy man once again haven't you uh, yeah, uh, covering a lot of miles on the motorway. Um, I've been at Brands Hatch and Brands Hatch. So two weekends <laughs> ago for the for the finale, uh, the championship showdown for the Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship, where yep. Ash Sutton equaled uh, the four titles um, uh, record held by Colin Turkington and Andy Rouse as well. Um, and Ash Sutton is just um, unstoppable at the moment. He is... Yep. Um, called uh, all sorts of amazing things by his um uh, by his contemporaries including jesus christ and god this year um, <laughs> wow. because oh. i know and, and that's from his own teammates um because he has been doing just a most remarkable job uh, and, yeah. and also of course all the support race uh for, for the toka sports um they were all crowned at brands hatch as well um and then last weekend, I was lucky enough to be back at Brands Hatch for the finale of the Bennett's British Superbikes. And uh, and to be honest, if you're wondering if I've got a slightly hoarse voice, yes, I have. And um, I finally caught up on a bit of sleep because the adrenaline that was pumping around after the last two weekends was too much to handle, I have to say. Yeah, horse voice and plenty of horsepower as well. Oh, uh, right, say. Just before we move on with the podcast. Just, what, uh, what, 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 what have you, hang on, I haven't oh, asked you what you've been doing. Oh well, you know that's very that's very you nice. You didn't think you, I wanted uh, to know, did you? I don't think I did. What, what, yeah, <laughs> that was whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I was at Donington. I was at Donington Park. Uh, of course, you on, were on Saturday for the British Endurance Championship season finale, and what a finale it proved to be. Uh, we're going to touch on these a little bit later, actually, with one of our guests. So I won't go into it too much now, uh, but we will be touching all of the action that's been going on across the BARC shortly with uh, our next guest. Uh, just before we do move on, though, I just want everybody to know we were running a Draper Tools competition a couple of episodes ago. Uh, a winner has been selected, so we will be in touch with you for that one. So uh, congratulations. I don't actually know who it is, so congratulations, whoever you are. Uh, somebody from the BARC will be in touch with you. Uh, now, it's scarcely believable, really, that we've only got a couple of episodes Episodes left of our first series of the Barking Mad podcast, but on the off chance that this is the first time you're joining us, let me tell you what we're all about. So every fortnight we come together, Alan and I, with a host of guests. We chat all things motorsport, focus on the latest events inside the UK's biggest motor racing club, yes, the BARC, and some of the biggest topics in the sport from around the world. And Ian, we're also joined by a host of fantastic guests. And today's episode is no different. We'll be joined, uh, we'll be welcoming BARC event manager David Whedon and former Formula One and Le Mans racer turned motoring journalist, television presenter and uh, a scarer of multiple passengers around the Thruxton <laughs> circuit, Tim Nadell. So you can guarantee we're going to get quite a few anecdotes as this show. We certainly are. 8,000, I believe 8,000 passages is taken. That's that's uh, that's remarkable, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely it's remarkable. It's an amazing statistic, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and, and on that note, uh, it really does promise to be another great episode. Uh, before that, though, it is time to hear from our fantastic partners, as you can say, big on fuel with BP Fleet Solutions UK. BP Fleet Solutions keeps on delivering huge value for Barking Mad listeners. They are now offering 8p per litre, 8p per litre off fuel at 1,200 UK petrol stations across the UK. Now, this exclusive offer for BARC members and Barking Mad listeners saves you 8p per litre off standard and premium grade fuels. There's also significant savings to be made on electric charging as well. This offer is exclusive to the Barking Mad podcast. Rightio, Alan. Uh, with uh, that all out the way, I think it's time we got stuck into things. This is the Barking Mad podcast. <laughs> Now, 
Now, there's no better place to kick off things on this week's podcast than by talking about all things Bark. And I'm delighted to welcome back the perfect person to do just that. It's the club's event manager, David Whedon. David, how are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, guys. How are you? Very well. Very really well. Really good, indeed. David. Good. Good. It's been uh, it's been quite a hectic time for the BARC, isn't it? Let's uh, let's head to Donington Park. I was there at the weekend for the British Endurance Championship, uh, and it was the season finale, David. Yeah, absolutely. Um, year two of Beck, I think. Second year we've had Beck. Second year, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to be fair, they had a cracking entry list. Um, really, really strong entry list um, for the start uh, end of the year. Hopefully that'll, that'll go in into, into 2024. But um, yeah, big kudos to, to car number 28. The team had Porsche um, championship winners with, with Brad Thurston and Daryl De Leon, Adam Hatfield and Alex Sedgwick, I think, were the four drivers over the season. So um, pat on the back it, to them. It um, was a magnificent performance, wasn't it? I was actually in the Team Hard garage as the chequered flag fell and I interviewed Daryl De Leon's mum uh, about five minutes before the end. I can tell you the tension in the garage was like nothing you've seen. And uh, I asked her what it would mean, of course, if uh, Daryl can get over that line and they can win the title. She couldn't answer me because she broke down in tears. Bless her. Oh, <laughs> cool. And she's lovely, isn't she? She's a really, really nice person, yeah. Oh, she is absolutely lovely. She's always happy, always got a smile on her face yep, as well. And yep, yep. Uh, Brad, obviously Brad wasn't in the car. It was Daryl who took the car over the, over the line and Brad was... Um, yeah, uh, he was absolutely delighted. In fact, before the race, he was very nervous because I saw him walking through the paddock um, and he was very, very nervous. And I was going to interview him during on the grid as the cars line up on the grid. And he waved me away because <laughs> he was oh, very nervous. Oh. Indeed, bless him. Uh, but it was a fantastic finish. Like I said, David, a cracking grid of cars as well, wasn't there? Uh, just I think it's 24 cars in total or so taking it yeah, home really uh, strong, on the Saturday. Strong. Was it just that though? Was it David? We had classic touring cars and a brick car trophy there as well. Uh, yeah, classic touring cars. Obviously, um, finishing their season off. That's been a really strong one. Um, just phenomenal amount of um, different entries throughout the year. Um, it's a funny one because we we still seem to be putting new drivers on throughout the season for classic touring yeah. cars. There never seems to be a stop of of new drivers. There's just always new people wanting to race in the CTCRC. So. Um, we're very lucky um, that, that that's the case and it, they've had a really strong year um, again and uh, yeah Brick Car um, the Royal Brick Car um, Endurance Championship obviously um, went down to the wire po- post race I believe but I think it was um, Reese Lloyd and Jack Meakin from, from Dragon Sport in their clear who took the overall Brick Car Endurance title this year so um, well done to them Every single race this year for the Royal Brick Car Trophy Championship Rhys Lloyd and Jack Meakin have had one of their team or family members somewhere out around the circuit dressed up. One, uh, they've dressed up as a platypus, a dragon, uh, all sorts of uh, crazy things that they've dressed up. Uh, Rhys Lloyd will be able to fill his more in that one. But uh, yeah, great, great to see that, uh, that one go to those guys. I always talk to them up and down the pit lane as well. They're always happy to have a chat and very competitive throughout the, the Brick Car Trophy. David. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I get on really well with Reese um, and all the guys from Dragon Sport, and obviously they're, they're run by um, Rob Gaffney from Amigo Motorsport. Yeah. Um, so they do get called the Welsh Mexicans quite a lot. Um, <laughs> is every now and again there's a, a hola boyo as you're walking through the paddock. But um, um, no, I, I think it's fantastic, and, and the Clio class in the um, Brick Car is really strong this year. They've had a lot of Clios. Um, obviously, factory built paddle shift proper pucker race cars um, that aren't that expensive anymore so um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a few more Clio's out there next year as well yeah definitely lots of friendly rivalry going on there as well I, I believe Genius Saloons were there as well on the Sunday they too, were right? yeah so I think they've got last round at Brands Hatch um, the firework meeting on the 4th and 5th of November um, truck meeting so um, there should be some fireworks in that one we'll, we'll get a champion decided there and then yeah, we uh, we had more action as well with the North West Centre uh, meeting as well. So tell us more. That was the final, wasn't it? Their race day of the year. Uh, it was, yeah. The 40th anniversary um, celebrations. It was. They've had over 460 races in those 40 years and over oh, 700 God. different drivers. And um, I know that Rick Wood, who sponsors it through his CNC Heads and company, he's raced like 35 of those 40 years. Wow. Um, so, so for a, a regional... Um, sort of championship run by our, our regional Northwest Centre to get to 
40 years is, is fantastic. But to do that with um, strong, big grids year after year after year is um, a testament to everyone up in the North West Centre who, who organised and administrated the, the, the CNC Heads Championship. Now I can see... Alan Hyde is absolutely looking at him. He's chomping at the bit here because he is desperate to talk about the British touring car chat. Go on, Alan, over to you. Touring cars, touring cars. Uh, obviously, <laughs> David, <laughs> a BARC run championship, the Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship. Um, and, and what a, a record equaling and record breaking year we got um, come to its finale a couple of weeks ago uh, at Brands Hatch with, with Ash Sutton, a four time champion now. Yeah, we called this one at the start of the year, didn't we? We discussed this um, earlier on, but fourth championship for Ash Sutton. Um, like I said earlier in the year, I reckon, I said if he won the fourth title, I'd put him as the, the best touring car driver on the face of the planet right now. And um, he's come through on that one. So, um, yeah, superb. It, it's great seeing Napa in the UK as well, mm, uh, yeah, really pushing. Yeah, obviously, we've got Napa trucks and the Napa minis. But yes, yeah. um, for Napa to come over Napa and win Porsche. the title sort of in their, their first um sort of go at BTCC and it's great to see um motor base get the focus competitive um what a car this season oh, yeah. um, just night and day difference from previous seasons so um Dave Bartram and all these guys um down in, in West Kingsdown pat on the back to them because they've, they've done a fantastic job this year uh, David Bartram started motorbase performance some years ago and then uh, a few years ago sold the company to uh, to Pete Osborne and Pete Osborne has carried on the uh, um, uh, uh, many of the uh, team personnel that, that David Bartram had when the, when motorbase performance started have carried over and they were there celebrating at the end of Sunday as well in the new guise of the of the uh, of the outfit now called Alliance Racing and uh, and Ash Sutton and, and all of the pre season preparation because I think that's what's um, resulted in this season. They did a lot of pre-season work and, and it paid off from the outset. So brilliant to them. But it's it's not just, David, a, a, about the touring cars. It's also about the um, all of the support package as well, which is a, a, an incredible support package that we have, including the, the very international uh, British F4 Championship. And the man that started the season so well, Finished the season so well, and in in the final race after the final race, Louis Sharp was was named the champion for twenty twenty three. Yeah, absolutely superb. Um, really competitive year this year in British F four. A um, lot of overseas drivers, um, and like I said in previous episodes of the podcast, you know, um, the parity with the Italian championship with the chassis and engines, I think, has made a big difference. Um, and I can see the British F4 Championship just growing and growing and growing. Yeah. So two other championships uh, decided part of the Toka support package. Mini Challenge, Mini JCW, uh, Mini Challenge, and uh, and Porsche Carrera Cup GB as well. Dan Zelos, the, the champion in Mini Challenge, who has had a phenomenal year and celebrated uh, winning the title on Saturday by doing um, crazy carts on the cart um, circuit at Brands Hatch. I, I'm not sure he thought that was a great idea, to be perfectly honest. They are a bit crazy. And Adam Smalley, the uh, Porsche junior driver in his second year of the of the scholarship with Porsche claiming the title in Carrera Cup as well. So um, uh, plenty of excitement in the support paddock. Yeah, definitely. I think Adam, I could see him going on to some bigger things in GTs. And when you've got someone like Porsche GB backing you, um, you know, you've, you've got to be pretty good. Um, so for him to, to get the, the Porsche junior gig and, and be working his way up through the Porsche um ladder i suppose because it goes all the way to the the super cup on the grand prix package you know the etc cetera, etc cetera, and the the WEC and, and 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 stuff like that so i think adam's got a really good future um dan z lost why isn't he in btcc hmm. Hmm. good question yeah and i could have said that two or three years ago yes um, yeah you yeah. know that the the kids are real deal um yeah. you know and, and i think um i feel that there's a lot of Talent is wasted over the years. Paul Rivette's one of them. I don't mm. think he ever really got that shot in no, BTCC no. that he actually really deserved. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say that Dan hopefully will go the opposite way and get get a good shot at the BTCC because I think the kid really deserves it. And, uh, of course, we also crowned uh, Joe Warhurst, the uh, champion in the Porsche Sprint Challenge as well, which has been a, a really good entry this year. And he's a very exciting, exciting young driver. Maybe he'll do what Harry Foster did um, 
this year and that step up into Carrera Cup for next year. Let's um, let's keep our fingers crossed and, and hope so. Um, uh, but Ian, what we're doing now is as championships are coming to their conclusion, we're beginning to to either the championship awards evening. Yes, uh, that's coming up actually. Before that, though, there is still one more event to go, isn't there? The, the on-track action isn't quite finished yet for 2023, uh, is it, David? Because you've touched on it already. We head to Brands Hatch on the 4th and 5th of November. And shall we say it's the rather large matter of the British Truck Racing Championship <laughs> still to be decided? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be honest with you. I think it's, if Ryan loses the title now, I'd be very surprised um, for the for the Division 1. Um, in in the trucks, I mean, he's just so far ahead, um, and he's so good at picking up points, um, very consistent, and and just ekes it out a little bit each meeting. Um, but yeah, if 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 anybody can take the title off Ryan, I'd be very very surprised. Um, but like you said, Brands Hatch, it's um it's a big event, so they always put a bit of a show on at the end of the year, don't they? Although we're worth sticking around to the evening for the fireworks as, as well, isn't it? On Sunday, yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. It's, I um, worked at that meeting for years and years and years. And and for the last couple of years, I haven't been able to commentate at it because it has clashed on the Saturday night with the Toker uh, Night of Champions, so the awards presentation. So, um, so I, I, I couldn't do it last year. Um, it was horrible, horrible weather on on the Sunday, as far as I remember. Really wet last year on mm -hmm. the Sunday, um, but this year I don't care. I'm hedging my bets. Um, the the Toker Awards evening is only at Silverstone, so it's not too far. So on Sunday, I'm committed to coming as a spectator to the fireworks and trucks. Do you know what, Brilliant. Alan? I will join you there. I'm actually uh, I'm at a wedding on the fourth, but the fifth, Are you? I'm free. So I tell you what, why don't we go and get ourselves a little coffee? We we'll meet and, up and uh, have and a hot. Chocolate. Yeah, Hot absolutely. chocolate and marshmallows. <laughs> I'm all for that because we're also going to see Mini Challenge Trophy, yeah, yeah. Junior Saloon cars, pickup truck. I love the pickup trucks as well. Yeah, and definitely. Legends as well. How cool is that? Yeah, Legends. Will Gibson, I think David is still leading that championship, is he? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, and obviously, so. this is the, the final round. I know Connor and Mills won the Elite Car Cup, the, the Touring Car Support, but yeah. Um, and then we've got, like I said, Junior Saloon um, Championship to be decided. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few championships left to, to tie up. I know minis as well. Speaking to, to, um, Rhea this week, I believe minis actually have reserves for this one. Wow. Oh. Goodness me. Yeah. Wow. I, think we're, well, I think we can run 34 cars at the start of a race and I believe they've got 36 entries at the moment. It could be wow. more. Wow. Um, so the, the, the mini challenge trophy, um, has really grown this year. I think it's went from about. Averaging 25 to 30 cars, and it's up there sort of 36, 37s now. So, um, pat on the back to them. They, they've obviously got a, a really successful championship, and yeah, um, well, people people want to do it. I mean, that, at the yeah, end of the day, yeah. that's the that's the answer to the question of how good is your championship or how popular is it? It's how many yeah. people want to turn up and race in it. So, if you're getting more than you're actually allowed, then fantastic. It's certainly the one to be at, it's certainly the, the meeting to be at for the remainder of 2023, isn't it? But also the, the thing to be at, as we touched on it, Alan, time to dust off the tuxedos, isn't oh, it? Yes. Because yes, the Bark Championship Awards evening. David, where is it? When is it? How, how do we go about getting ourselves there? So it's all changed this year. We've moved venue. Um, we were at Lip Hook at the old forms in the last two or three years. Um, but this year we're going to be more central um, for, for people coming down from further up north. So, we're at the um, Crown Plaza Hotel in Stratford upon Avon, nice. and um, this year's Big Night Out Awards dinner will be the third of February, Saturday, the third of February, twenty twenty four. I take um, it my tickets in the post, is it? Because uh... I have absolutely, <laughs> in, yeah, the golden <laughs> ticket. Um, only if you come dressed as Willy Wonka, though. Um, Deal <laughs> done. So, will, um, don't challenge me because I'll do it. <laughs> that was a silly thing, to do, wasn't it? Um, tickets will be available um, to, to for, for general per, um, purchase via the Bark website very, very soon um, through the Bark shop. Um, obviously, once we get the the firework meeting out of the way, and we know who all the champions are, and champions will get their individual invites in the post. Um, and once we know who's coming back. Um, et cetera, et cetera, we'll be able to put the rest of the tickets on sale to the, to the, I've, the general I've public. So. I've hosted, very proudly hosted that dinner for the last 11 or 12 years. I haven't been booked yet, David. So if I don't get booked, please, can I have an invitation? I'm sure you can. 
Thank you very much indeed. Can I'm I sure have an will. invitation too, please, David? <laughs> I'm sure we can solve something else. Can I sit at Alan's table as well, please? Enough, enough already. Uh, let's have a look th- forward to uh, 2024, can we, um, and talk about what winter looks like, first of all, David, for uh, the BARC, because that's preparatory work already underway for next year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with regards to dates, I believe touring cars or the BTCC talker calendar is already out. Um, it was out in May. There we go. Alan Gow um, takes great pride in bringing his calendar out before anyone else. Which helps us, to be fair. It does, yeah. Know where we're, we're going to be going on certain weekends. So um, no, the, the club championship um, calendar as a whole will be out hopefully before the end of this year, but if not very early in January. Although um, some of the, the club championships and our classic touring cars have already released their dates for next year, our provisional dates for next year. So some of the championships will be releasing their own individual calendars, but we as a, a club um, will be putting out the, the whole calendar, like I said, hopefully before the end of this year, but if not very early in January. Excellent stuff. A uh, lot to look forward to then in 2024. Still a lot to look forward to for the rest of 2023 as well. David, we better let you go and uh, sort out uh, Alan and I's invitations, if that's OK, uh, for that Bark Championship Awards evening. Uh, David, uh, enjoy the rest of the year. I'm sure we'll chat before then, but take care. David Weed and everybody. Right, guys. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Cheers, guys. Right, it's time to get into our second guest of the episode, and I've got a feeling we're going to hear some rather good tales from what can only be described as a glittering career, both Ooh. behind the wheel and in front of the cameras. Uh, welcome to Barking Mad, Tiff Nadell. Oh, uh, thank, you. Tiff. thank you. Thank well, you. Hold on a minute. What do I mean? What do I mean? Second guest? My second best? Who's, who's no, first guest? No, we saved the best till last. <laughs> obviously, well, no, I need to know who was first guest. Now, David Whedon from the BARC. Okay, all right. Okay. So he's been talking club news. All right. So okay. um, he, he's you're, you're he, a star he, guest, Tiff. You're, you're well, a star. I just check that's, I just yeah. wanted to check yeah. that, you know. I don't want to get, you know, don't want to get David, second billing. D- David was your warm up act, <laughs> okay. And quite frankly, the audience are tepid, so All good right. luck with this, okay. Tim. Um, now I've got to tell you where I am, uh, because uh, today, so I've got a new roof going on my house at the moment, right. So normally I would be at home, but today I'm at Thruxton, I'm in the media center, right, and I am sat about 12 feet away from the very first time I ever met you when you were a touring car driver, driving in a Nissan, and you were collecting um, the timesheets from uh, qualifying, and I was doing the same thing, and we we spoke, and we had our very first conversation. This would have been mid nineteen ninety. Yeah, but I, I can't have been racing, though. I must have just been a guest for Nissan, because I never raced the Nissan at Thruxton. It's one of my biggest I, regrets. I didn't race a touring car race at Thruxton, because I'm well, good at so Thruxton. What, so what you were doing, Tiff, was swanning around in the overalls, pretending that exactly. you were driving. Yeah, I was the, right, PR. Okay. I was the s- PR tart <laughs> for Nissan, brought along. Future and signing driver. autographs. Right, there yeah. you go. There yeah. you go. Um, Hold on. What's wrong with your roof? Is this storm coming along? When well, your, your house will be flooded with the rain coming, it's disaster everywhere. <laughs> well, it's hopefully the last day today. Okay. The last few tiles are going right. on. So, okay. um, Just so, in time, according to the weather uh, forecast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the doom and gloom that we're about to get with the weather over the next couple of days. Tiff, um, I mean, we could talk to you um for an awful long time i've read your book um there's a lot in it um but can i take you back to 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 when you first became interested in in motor racing and automotive when when, when did that happen how little was tiff was dad's fault it was all dad's fault and i've got a wonderful collection i noticed when the goodwood revival was on there was a big fuss this year about the, the enamel badges the, you know the wonderful badges so dad went to Brooklands before the war. So he was a junior car club member and then became the Brooklands club and then became the BARC. And I've got all his enamel badges from Brooklands and then going to Goodwood, all the members' badges. I've got the whole collection uh, of every year of those wonderful badges that they were talking about. So dad was at Brooklands. He lived in Weybridge and uh, got lured to the aero engine monsters roaring around uh, Brooklands. He actually did a couple of driving tests, borrowing his mum's Fiat 500. <laughs> so my father competed at Brooklands, albeit a driving test in the middle of the airfield. <laughs> um, Nothing wrong with that. And then actually contested the first two members' meetings. When Goodwood right. opened, of course, you know, Brooklands was closed, so therefore the only place for motorsport 
the BARC moved to Goodwood. Um, so he actually competed in the first two uh, members meetings. The three-lap handicap race in his Ford V8. He had an old Ford, and one of the ones we could put the put puts the um, air, the, the windscreen flat. Great, I've got glamorous photos. He's wearing his sunglasses, his shades, his arrows. You know, he looks he looks pretty cool. No crash helmets, of course. Um, so then, of course, when I was born in 1951, and uh, as soon as I could walk, he, he took me off to Goodwood, where, you know, as soon as I climbed over the banking, of the same banking that's still there, at the exit of the chicane, and yeah, saw yeah, these yeah. loud, noisy, colourful machines being wrestled through the corners by these heroes, you know. That was all I wanted to be, was a racing driver. So um, I dragged my parents to Goodwood as often as possible, spectating, and then we went to Brands Hatch quite a few times. Boxing Day Brands Hatch was always a wonderful day out with the cold turkey and rugs over our legs watching the racing. So, uh, yeah, it was just, it was dad's fault, really. And um, I just got absorbed into motorsport from a very young age. But we had no family money. It was never going to happen. Um, I lived in Weybridge, Surrey. As soon as you say I, I was born in Weybridge, Surrey, oh, another bloody rich kid. Yeah, <laughs> bloody, <laughs> silver spoon in the mouth. So, uh, in fact, we, we were what I call, we were on the wrong side of the railway line at uh, Weybridge. <laughs> yeah. My dad actually started renting a flat for the family in 1949 in, in Weybridge, Oatlands Village, um, and he kept renting, renting for the next 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> Didn't right. want a mortgage. He couldn't afford a mortgage. I mean, no, he, could no. have, he could have got a £10 mortgage for an acre of land in Weybridge, so he's worth about £20 million now. But, uh, yes, yeah. So, no, so he lived on the, the wrong side of the railway lines. Huge racing you know, enthusiast spectators. Um, and it was only when I entered this competition with Autosport and, and won this Formula Ford racing car that the, the dream suddenly became an incredible reality overnight. It was an amazing story, really. What was it like, Tiff, then, when, when you won the competition and got into Formula Ford for the first time and you lined up on that grid? What, what was the feeling, the emotion magical, going through you? Magical. I mean, I had been to the, as soon as I left school, the summer of 69, I was a good record that. Oh, yeah, that is a good record. <laughs> um, a couple of years out, but I, yeah. I, I, uh, I, uh, well, yeah, because this was 69 was when I left school and borrowed Mum's Morris Thousand and emptied my post office account from oh, wow. where I'd been washing people's cars and cutting lawns. I went down to Brands Hatch, the racing driver's school, and uh, handed over my £10 for the initial trial of 10 laps. And uh, Tony Land Frankie was there, the wonderful teacher. And uh, so I did do a year of, of racing driver's school, just spending... In fact, the second year, 1970, um, they used to have school races, which were, which were 30 quid, I think, for a five-lap race. And so I did do some school races in 1970. So... And my, my dream was, I guess, if I spent all my money going to the school, if I met, you know, a millionaire or preferably a millionaireess in Weybridge, you know, the other side of the railway line, um, <laughs> they'd sponsor me. But you know, that didn't happen. Instead, I won this, you know, won this racing car. And it was just, I just, oh, it's just an, an amazing story that, you know, seven years later, I'm on the Grand Prix grid. It's, it's a story that I could never believe happened still when no. I look back, you know, because. It changed your life. It I completely, you know, I yeah. started university as a, a civil engineer, the five-year sandwich degree course as a, as a civil engineer with George Wimpy. And luckily I was uh, working every summer and in university every winter. So all of a sudden, you know, I became a civil engineer five days a week and a mechanic in my little garage five nights a week. And then the racing weekend, I was the mechanic and the van driver and the, and the racing driver. And that was the beauty of Formula Ford, you know. I mean, when I won the car, I had a very old, rusty Morris 1000 Traveller. And uh, one of my favourite videos, if you go to Love Cars, you know, on YouTube, we've all, got, we've all got YouTube nowadays, but if you look at the Love Cars and go down, find the one with me. We recreated my first few races because um, in 1970, I didn't have a camera, you know. I, uh, yeah. no, I didn't have a phone that had a camera on it as well. No, I mean, it was ridiculous. No, no. So I had no photographs of the Morris Thousand from towing the Formula Ford. Ford. Uh, so luckily, I managed to borrow some money. We recreated the moment, which was the wow. most tearful item I've done on the Love Cars YouTube, and well worth it. Wow. Please go and look at it because I'm very proud of that film. But so Formula Four was just magnificent because the cars weren't the technical setup; you know, they weren't crucial. Um, yeah. So you could run it yourself, and there were ten manufacturers. So if you showed a bit of talent, you get a cost price chassis from designed from Eldon, or get a free chassis from someone else, and. A scholar helped me so much. The engine tuners, if you showed promise, they'd lend you an engine. Um, so it was so good because without any budget, you could get good equipment eventually and, and work your way, as I did, to the top of the national scene. So it was a fabulous, fabulous formula. And because the cars weren't technical and it's science that's, that's ruined all motorsport. 
uh, and created, you know, a Formula Four budget of what two hundred thousand pounds, and you have to have three mechanics, a psychologist, a fitness trainer, <laughs> someone designing your crash helmet colours to paint it up. And you know, I would never have become a racing driver or professional driver in the modern world. It's just got out of control. So, who in the modern um, uh, top tier of of racing drivers would be okay if they weren't in the most technologically advanced racing cars if they were in a mechanical tiff nadell type race oh, they'd probably car. all but they'd all be good i mean the you know, natural talent i mean the, the, the talent in grand prix world now is out of this world i mean when you think that you know when i did my grand prix 1980 um didn't qualify at Monaco. And when I didn't qualify at Monaco, it was the last time and the first time forever that there was no British driver on a Grand Prix grid because John Watson didn't qualify either. Um, but, you know, 1979, it was almost the arrival of the Brazilians began it. And in the 50s and 60s, you know, we used to have six or seven British drivers. You know, the Grand Prix racing was was European drivers. Uh, oh, we had Fangio and Gonzalez. We did have them earlier on, but they were obviously from South America. But it was really the Brazilians started doing British Formula 3, which brought us Nelson Piquet, brought us Ayrton yeah. Senna. Yeah. You know, British F3 was the place to be in in the whole world to show off your talent. Was, yeah. Yeah. But since then, you know, drivers have come from every part of the planet. And uh, so to, to be, float to the top of, of, of European single-seater championships is so hard because there's so much talent around, you know, and it's incredibly skillful drivers, you know, can't get anywhere near a Grand Prix seat because, of, you know, a slightly better driver above you in the standings. What was the circus like back then, Tiff? Turning up to Monaco in 1980 as a Formula One driver, we see what <laughs> F1's like now and it's almost untouchable, isn't it? What was it like well, then? Well, we'll go back to my debut. It was actually the Belgian Grand Prix, which was at Zolder, sadly not Spa. Yeah. And I was on a one-car team, you know. First, we had to qualify because there were 30 cars turning up and only 24 got on the grid. Uh, mum and Dad, um, that used to have old Morris Thousands, by now, Mum had her first car a Nissan 120Y estate. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and mum and dad and my girlfriend that's now my wife, Patsy, drove out in the Nissan 120Y through the English Channel, bought tickets and clung to the fences to watch me make my Grand Prix debut. You know, as now, you know, Norris's dad would come in his Learjet, you know, and uh, they'd all arrive in jets. <laughs> so mum and dad were in their Nissan travelling across the continent and um, I was this rookie driver, you know, got this chance, you know, to, to, to perform on the, on the highest level, which to me was just the, the most wonderful moment, you know, because I had no money and everything had been done on talent alone and got through. Um, but I knew Jan Lammers was coming. The worst thing was that I knew the team wanted Jan Lammers. And uh, at a one-card team, it was hard to prove how good you were. You had no established driver with you. Uh, and so I actually qualified 23rd out of the 24 starters and found myself on, on the back row of the grid looking across Emerson Fittipaldi, one of my schoolboy <laughs> heroes, me, Emerson, Emerson, me, and uh, battle with Emerson for, for 12 laps for the honour of being last in the British Belgian Grand Prix before the engine broke. And, but, you know, Regansoni had only qualified that car, 23rd. Um, I went to Monaco where only 20 got through out of 30. And although, you know, the experience of driving a Grand Prix car around Monaco was just unbelievable. Um, yeah, I actually qualified in the rain. I was 19th out of the, on the, in the wet on Thursday because they had that Thursday-Saturday qualifying system back in those days at Monaco. Um, but it dried out and I crashed the stupid ensign. And then Lammers was coming because Lammers had been the star of Long Beach. He qualified fourth um, in the, another not very popular car, the ATS. But he only had that seat until Mark Shearer's legs was broken because he'd broken his legs. It was all... In those days, there were plenty of opportunities because drivers got the odd broken ankle or worse. So, uh, But uh, poor Jan that took the ensign from me then failed to qualify for six or seven Grand Prix on the trot. He couldn't even make the 24. So sort of looking back, I feel, well, actually, I, I did quite a good job, you know. Yeah. But um, so it ruined poor Lammers' career. And obviously, mine ended when they put Lammers in. But um, it was still to have done that one Grand Prix meant so much, you know, because I've got, I've got the watch. I've got the watch. Which says, <laughs> oh, wow. With my name on it, I'm a member of the Grand Prix Drivers Club. That's my most cherished oh, possession. Brilliant. Wow. Is the fact that I've got a watch that says I was a Grand Prix driver. And um, it meant so much, you know, it just did mean a lot after all that effort. And then, of course, I was very lucky then when I, I fell off the... I mean, Formula One, I mean, it's like Mount Everest. You know, yes, when you think... Yeah. I mean, now there's only 20 slots. 
And the great thing, going back to 1980, which I love and which is what's wrong with modern Grand Prix racing and the money involved, I looked it up in a book. 41 drivers tried to qualify or race in a Grand Prix in 1980. Yeah. So 41 yes. drivers yeah. had that moment of, of trying to qualify or making yes. it. You know, so even then, that's, you know, 40 is still a tiny number. You look at the you know, British football squads, Premier League, what they've got, yeah. 34 at least, I think, in each squad, and there's 20 of those, so that's yes. uh, 600 yeah. footballers, and that's just and that's in Britain just alone. Yeah. 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 Whereas the Grand Prix grid is 20 of the entire planet. Uh, and, of course, once you get to the peak and you don't hold on to the peak, you very soon slide down the other side because some little nipper snapper's coming up behind you that's done a better job. Um, but, you know, Group C uh, sports car racing just happened to be starting in 81, and, and that's what gave me a fantastic career you know, racing all around the world, 14 Le Mans, 24 hours. Were there no other options in 1980 after leaving Ensign? When no, I hung been, around for a it, bit. I nothing? nearly got Tyrrell driving. I went to the Grand Prix and stuck in the paddock with me overalls in a, in a bag. And uh, <laughs> sort of Ken Tyrrell showed some interest. Actually, funny enough, I approached um, um, Williams, Frank Williams, and sort of said, how about me testing the cars? Because it was Alan Jones and Reutemann. And I, I suggested, you know, be a test driver. And this was before test drivers. And he actually said, well, why would we want one, Tiff? Because, you know, Jones and Reutemann want to do all the testing they can do. And it was like the next year that Jonathan Palmer got a Williams test driving contract. Um, so almost my idea was before it's time. And um, so, because I mean, when you think back at the Williams test drivers, because Palmer sort of became a Grand Prix driver with that, then, of course, we had, um, <clears throat> oh, you know, Scotsman, things, and who else was the test drivers for Williams who became Grand Prix drivers? The, the we got Coulthard. statistician. Coulthard, David Coulthard, he was the test driver for Williams. So this reserve driver thing became a, a place to be uh, sort of after 1980 and onwards. Didn't you say, Tiff, that y you thought at the time, um, because you were an exuberant driver <laughs> away from Grand Prix ri uh, racing, a, a spectacular sideways motion yes. around, around the circuit, that that kind of worked against Backfired. you get, with getting a... Backfired a, yeah. badly. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, because when I had the, the Top Gear offer, so this was 1987, Formula First, and uh, Chris Goffey was supposed to drive the Formula First car, um, but he broke his ankle. I'd by now been commentating alongside Murray. You know, Murray was my, I was the, one of the, again, my, I was one of the earliest uh, expert analysts because in those days that was a rare thing and it was just the commentators. Um, and of course, James Hunt couldn't be bothered to do Formula 2 and Formula 3 and Formula <laughs> 4. And so I worked a lot with Murray. So the BBC, you knew, I, knew what I sounded like and everything else. And um, so, yes, yeah, so, so when I went to go and do this Formula First test, I thought too often on telly, I watch it, you know, and especially nowadays without power, with power steering, Formula One is turning to the corner yes, and yeah. straight it up. And this yeah. is like Lewis Hamilton breaking the lap record, tracking down the leader, and it's still turning to the corner and <laughs> take the lock off again. And, and so I deliberately decided, right, oh, I'm going to make this look a bit, you know, look a bit exciting, look like you're on the edge. So I deliberately chucked this Formula First sideways everywhere. Um, seemed to have the ability to talk at the same time. And, and uh, so the BBC loved that. And so I kept doing it. And, but, of course, I now thought, I'm on BBC television. Every team's going to want me now because I've got the extra kudos. Yeah, yeah. But I think the team managers thought, well, look at the way he drives. You know, he's lunatic. <laughs> he doesn't suit modern motorsport. Um, so, yeah, I think sometimes it worked against me being a TV star after all, instead of a serious dedicated. Of course, you know, when I race, you know, I don't drive quite so much like a lunatic, but, you know. I mean, Ronnie Peterson did and Keke Rosberg did. So, well, why not? So, yeah. I think it was the tyres that killed me, funnily enough, that really yeah. didn't work for me. Because that was, was it 79? I got the Tolman test drive that didn't get the drive in the end in Formula 2. And they were the first radials. Radials arrived. And radials don't like going sideways and no. being on power. You know, radials, no. you either break in the straight line or you turn and um they didn't like drifting so you, we don't get those slip angles anymore with radial tires as soon as you're past you know 10 degrees you know you're spinning the car in formula one whereas the days of you know ronnie and everybody else broadside but you know that was the old cross ply tire that was much more forgiving uh for sideways loading so yeah the style of driving has got outdated 
I just got outdated, Alan, early on. <laughs> we, I don't believe it for a minute. Although I was 27 years it. old, you know, Grand Prix debut, I was 27. I mean, this is the yeah. thing. I, mean, this yeah. is I, I feel so sorry yeah. for the people on the wrong side of railway lines in Weybridge now. Yes. Because, you know, yeah. the, we always used to say the rule of thumb was it takes 10 years to make a Grand Prix driver. So you couldn't race till you were 17 in England. You had to have a driver's licence. So we were 17 to 27. That was our 10 mm. years. That was normal, yes. you know. But now, of course, they start at eight. So they're 18. They've done their 10 years. Yeah. Um, but you can't do the eight to 18 unless you've got a dad driving you to the circuit, a dad paying for the car or a dad yes. paying for the team. So you cannot do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you now start at 17 when you start earning money, you know, you go Formula Ford and Formula 4, I got really annoyed when the McLaren Autosport, they still do it, I think, first put an age limit. You know, it had to be a young driver. And if you were 23 years old on one day, you couldn't enter the Autosport. Yeah. It was 22. Yeah. And, and that they shouldn't put the age limit on any competition. You can have a panel of judges, you know, when the 12 entries go in or they whittle it down, don't they, from eight to four. That's okay, I mean. let the judges behind doors say so quietly, oh, he's a bit old, that one. Bit but old, don't yeah. put a line of age no. on motorsport. Um, so and it's you know all the press love you know they go on and on about the younger driver, the younger driver, and it, that, that's a sad thing for a, a driver that hasn't had you know a silver spoon youth that can go karting every weekend. I, I often look back to for uh, result sheets from um, token meetings from ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and I see names in the support races that were winning <laughs> races, winning championships. Yeah. I wonder what they're doing now because yeah, they're a really good driver. They're all the to working with me on the racing well, experience, the driver many, experience. Many of them are, and yeah. many of them are, are, are doing city jobs or whatever, yeah. and a million miles away from motorsport, which is such a such a great shame, isn't it? Well, the, well, the other problem with the knock-on effect of this youth is that they're now buying GT drives. Mm, so yeah. we used to dedicate the, the single seater years from when you were seventeen to twenty-five, say, and trying to be a Grand Prix driver. You all did single seaters until you were twenty-five, twenty-six. Uh, no money. I didn't know a penny. I was still living at home when I was 20 with a Grand Prix driver. You know, I, well, I couldn't yeah, afford wow. and no income at all. Um, so then you'd say, okay, Grand Prix dream's over. I'll get a ride in a sports car, the professional drives, you know, again, supporting rich amateurs, still the same today to a certain extent. But now, of course, these kids are giving up single seaters at 18 and they're all filling the GT drives, which used to be for the sort of guy that's going to earn some money. And they're bringing money to get the GT drives. You know, I spoke yeah. to Alex Brundle, you know, who's trying to do LMP2. You know, and all those drives, they're all bringing money, bringing money. So there are no sort of professional slots as much as there used to be, apart from the, the very few that get through, like the Darren Turner that's done a magnificent job. So, yeah, the whole age thing floods the GT market with youngsters bringing budget. And the, those professional careers are becoming harder and harder to find yeah i mean talking of you know we, we've spoken about formula one uh, we've spoken about how difficult it is of course to get there after formula one you did have a bit of track success though didn't you tell us about le mans in 1990 well that was yeah, my best result as, as jeremy clarkson sums up my entire 30-year professional career <laughs> as he came third in a big race once <laughs> that was it. thanks jeremy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Le Mans, that, that was that, but that was the highlight of Rio. Really. By then, I was racing in Japan, which that was a good. Again, you see, Japan, where we went to earn money. A lot mm -hmm. of European, the Gaijin drivers, there used to be about 20 of us out there at one stage in yeah, the, in the yeah, 80s. Lot, yeah. But now they're, they're taking sponsorship, they're taking money to, into yeah. Japan, which has sort of taken the whole impetus out of that, you know, going over to earn some money. Um, but I was running this privately owned Porsche in the Japanese Championship with um, with, with Derek Bell was the co-driver. He was by then on his towards the end of his magnificent career, uh, but he was into the factory um, par car just for Le Mans. So he was signed to leave us. So I had to get co-drivers for Le Mans. So I got Anthony Reid in because I was looking for more tiffs, you know, guys that hadn't earned any money that I knew had the talent, uh, and David Sears. Um, so you know, I got those two along for Le Mans. Yeah, and I think Anthony's always very great. I've saved his life and his career, you know. We went off to Le Mans and uh, completely unfit, you know. We had a magnificent American uh, team manager that used to be a mechanic for Porsche that ran the car in America, in Japan. And he rebuilt the car himself. He saw some weak links and he changed them on our Porsche. He just rebuilt it himself and, his little, and trained up his um, Japanese crew to be drilled for the for the tyre stops. He brought in three of his old Americans as well to come to Le Mans, his old Porsche mechanic mates that, that crewed us. And uh, we just had this magnificent run of, of 24 hours of nothing going wrong with the car. 
Um, we all we all drove single stints as well. You know, we wow. weren't fit enough. We had no physicians. We had no dietitians. Um, we we didn't think it used to be traditional. You'd open with single stints, and at night time you'd do double stints, where it was cooler. But we just started blasting around as quick as we could. And if you do one hour like that, you don't feel that tired. But if you do two hours like that, you're oh, you're pretty knackered. Yes. Yeah. And so we never let ourselves go too knackered. We just and so we just never we just single stinted every fuel stop. We changed the driver. And uh, now I look at them doing quadruple stints and oh, one yeah. set of tires and yeah. the fitness. And apparently the Porsche boys they used to they used to live. They knew because if you have four hours, you only drive three was three eight for two, two times or three times yeah. don't you yeah, yeah 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 and in the build up to Le Mans they knew which stints they were doing and they sleep pattern yeah they get proper sleep yeah yeah but no, they wake up if their stint was 2 a.m to 4 a.m they would do that for three weeks before they'd wake up at 2 a.m yes yeah, until yeah. 4 a.m and then go and have a kick and the stuff the modern drivers do to me is just it's, ex- it's exhausting just to think about it but they're <laughs> so fit nowadays yeah I mean a lovely thing with sport, Le Mans 19- it? it really is <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm talking about 86. I was driving the Kramer Porsche team, for, and I've been racing Japan in, in private cars and stuff, and it was really hot what in Japan. What an era to be driving these oh, cars. The, the oh. 10 years of Group C. Goodness um, me. So we started using drinks bottles, which I'd never used before. But And so when I arrived at Le Mans, 1986, not that long ago, really, I went up to Mr. Kramer and said, uh, uh, do you think we could have a drinks bottle in the car, you know, for the race? And his words to me were, Tiff, you're a racing driver. You'll drive, not drink. And that was the end of the story. <laughs> so, what do you think nowadays? You know, all the fitness and the coaching, the dietitians. Yeah. In fact, that year also there was no. They offered no hospitality either. So they, I did the whole of more twenty four hour race that eating um, croque monsieur from the little wooden oh, hut in the back of the like paddock. That, no. Yeah, all I, can I go had for that for twenty four hours. Yeah, about <laughs> six croque monsieurs and wow. about a hundred cups of coffee. That was my wow. sports uh, fitness training. In I like to croque with Athlete the egg on top. That's what, that's what <laughs> oh no, egg on top as well. No, oh yeah. yeah, that's a croque madame, isn't it? With so yeah, so yeah, it is. Yes. So we ended up, and it was the, the race. We just kept going, and kept going. We were all knackered completely. And the Sunday was really hot. And I remember we were running about, we were running fourth and the factory um, Nissan was catching us. And so the big thing then was at least to be the first Japanese entry to finish. Yeah. And I remember him they were catching us. I was pounding around with a headache like a migraine, uh, probably dehydrated, probably completely unfit for the job. Um, but they, they faltered towards the end. So then we were cruising to fourth. And then um, this amazing moment when poor old, um, what's the name of the team, broke down three laps from the end and, and gave us third place, which uh, I didn't really feel sorry for them too much because I was too much in tears <laughs> and I was just just overwhelmed it was the most I magnificent bet. moment you know and the pit I crew bet. were going crazy because the pit signals used to be on the exit of the Mulsanne corner the, the slowest corner and so you'd always have to wait because you're accelerating at about 50 60 miles an hour so you would wave at them and say and I remember we had fourth on the board for for hours you know and I was doing the finishing stint you know and I came around and all of a sudden there was nothing on the board and people were running up and down the <laughs> pit signals of boards going everywhere because <laughs> I hadn't even noticed I'd overtaken the Brun car which had broken down and pulled right off the circuit so I hadn't noticed that it was broken down and all of a sudden I came around and they had the P3 on the board and all Brilliant. I mean tears thinking of it now it was just oh, it was well, amazing it's a, it's a massive so it was, event it's a huge well, yeah, the, moment in oh, your career well the top six were all factory cars you yeah. know the two silk cut Jaguars the first and second uh, fourth was the factory Porsche, wasn't it? It was Derek, it was Derek Bell was fourth. That was the other lovely thing in the factory Porsche. Aww. And fifth was the factory Nissan. And sixth was the factory Toyota. So we were a little private tiers team in our little car and um, very special. How cool. How absolutely cool. Tiff, when you meet fans, when you meet race fans and you chat to fans, I know you do, um, uh, particularly when you're at a, at a race meeting, you're yeah. watching and you're engaging with people, talking to people. What's the most asked thing from your racing career that you get talked to about? Oh, I don't know. Usually, what's Jeremy Clarkson really like? No, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, get, I get that. It's got to be from racing. I'm thinking probably know. in a touring car. Well, no, they, the people will say, I remember you in touring cars, but I never really had a good time in touring cars. But there was one race that just jugs my memory now slightly. But they, they, people do seem to remember some bloke called Mansell was in the same <laughs> race, I think. <laughs> that, that I'm glad you brought it one. up. Now, yes. Yeah, now, now you mentioned it. There is one race, yes. 
I didn't but, want to mention it, but now right. you have. Let's talk. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, the sad yeah. thing was when I got to the Touring Guard Drive, it was with Nissan, and we were going through a rubbish period, and it was it was so frustrating in a way to be in touring cars and be in a rubbish car. Um, and they got all sponsored with Old Spice. And again, I kept on being the reserve driver. I kept on coming yeah. in and beating yeah. the second driver, but then getting put in a spare car again. And then Eric van der Poel came along, and then and he was rubbish for a while because he didn't get on with the team. So I got brought in and got quicker than Eric van der Poel. And then... Um, of course, it was with um, the lovely oof, Matt, the team Nissan leader. You're all gone on me now. I don't remember. You do remember. Oh, Sadly, he died in the awful crash at Avos. Keith O'Dor. Keith. Uh, Keith O'Dor. Yeah. Of course, Keith was the number one driver, and you know he tended. And he was a really talented young kid, lovely bloke, and uh, you probably yeah. had the slight if, they had, if there was a better engine because there was the engines were churning through trying to make one quicker so Keith maybe had the slightly better one but anyway I was happy being his shotgun but um the car was rubbish and with that token shootout Nissan decided not to turn up so um otherwise I would have been in a crap Nissan uh, but Top Gear magazine that had just been launched they wanted to do a deal for me and so we got this Vauxhall Cavalier from Coss, you know which was a competitive car yeah yeah good car yeah. and I was so enjoying the race because finally I was in a touring car where when I led onto the straight, the car behind didn't just come halfway alongside every time and have to sort of outbreak them. And I had yes, Steve yeah. Soper behind me in his BMW, you know, yeah. and he was touching me occasionally. I was following um, David Leslie in the in the leader course, and of course, uh, Radicic was out front in the in the Monday. We were all close. Yes, it was yeah, a twelve thousand pounds to win. Yeah, that I was fighting big. the car, and I just remember every lap. I was thinking, this, well, this is what it should be like, you know. If I come out yeah. corners quick, you know, I'm not going to get dive bombed half overtaken down the straight every flipping lap, which is the Nissan story. And then all of a sudden, instead of a lovely white BMW behind me, this great blue thing arrived. Oh, <laughs> flipping! <it. It's> Nigel's <laughs> turned up. <laughs> And, of course, I could hear the roars, you know, when you went down the train of curves. Yeah, yeah you, you heard when Nigel overtook Soper behind me. You know, I don't know where he did it, but I could hear him flipping out. Oh, oh, yeah, that's changed. And then I went down to Redgate. And I was I was well ahead enough not to be out of break, so I didn't block. I took the racing line, to my regret now, all those years. Um, and as I was turning into the apex, here came the, the blue dive bomb. Uh, from Nige and he just clattered into the side of me at the apex you know took me he ro- drove me right off the road so I was now bouncing on the grass um, and Soper got by me on the exit of Redgate so I'd lost two places thanks to Nige's attack and then of course we went down the crater curves and into the old hairpin and there's old Nige getting all sideways and <laughs> And of course, he hadn't raced front wheel drive, and so he was trying to bang on opposite lock. Yeah, yeah. And me yeah. and Steve thought he'd exit stage right, you know, but he didn't exit because he got so much opposite lock, and of course, it bit when he lifted yes. off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, he, of course, he turned sharp left, and Soper had just got through, and I was next in line to go past, and I braked as hard as I could to, I locked up the brakes, yes, clattered yeah. into him, which did unfortunately guide him towards the bridge parapet at. Um, Adonis, and he, he still blames me to this day and wants an apology. I want him to apologise for ruining my chance to win £12,000. <laughs> the rumour was Nigel be... on. We need to get Nigel on. <laughs> well, <laughs> the rumour was he was being paid £100,000 just to yeah. be there, you yeah, know, yeah, and I was being yeah. paid nothing, but um, was hoping I might win. T- and also, I was in a competitive touring car for the first time in my life. So, but he had a lot of, you know, two sides to every story. But yes, so this is... <laughs> two sides to every story, Tim. No, I'm just... glad you shared it with us. Well, while we're on the <laughs> subject of touring cars um, you've been saying some pretty cool things on social media about our, <laughs> our current champion uh yeah ash, ash sutton claimed yeah. the title just a, a a week and a half ago um it, it, it has been a quite stunning season for him in yeah. touring cars and quite rightly um you've been quite forward in coming forward and saying what a what a joy to watch him yeah. he is Incredible talent. And this is why yeah. I keep on saying also that I want him to move on. I mean, I don't want to upset the British public or the touring car world. Um, it's a bit like Jason Plato, you know, to my mind, that he he would have been an interesting. He could have done a Darren Turner. He could have been a Le Mans winner. Um, Jason, huge amount of talent. But, you know, you get stuck in touring cars and you've got a bit of a salary going and it's a lot of fun and you don't have to travel too far. And, and Jason just stayed there and stayed there and stayed there, you know, all the time. You know, from when I've known him for about 20 years, I've been saying, you want to get in the Porsche? You want to get get out? Go go to Le Mans. And I really think that, that Ash should do that because I think there's a little bit of storyline in between. They've changed the name of his team, haven't they? 
And they have mumbled yes. something about they want to look to other areas of motorsport. And I think GT has been mentioned. Right. So maybe, maybe, you know, we might see Ash in a GT. What do they call the team now? I don't know. I forgot what they Alliance called it. Racing. Yeah. Al- Alliance Racing, yeah. So, you know, because, you know, there's, he could, he could be 10 times British touring car chat, but he probably will be if he stays for another 15 years uh, just doing touring cars. Because you know, I mean, the way he's to handle that car. I, mean, I know, I know, I know. I, I mean, know. Scotland, when he stayed out on slicks in the rain, and yes. he didn't really have to, and he was, he was incredible angles on slicks in a front-wheel yes. drive car. I mean, his, his car control is stunning, and his, his race craft, you know. So it's, uh, you know, a thing I'd love to see him move on. I mean, yeah, Colin well, Turkington's another very talented driver that sort of, you know, stayed in touring cars. And true. I just think it's, I don't know, it should be a place that the youngsters come in and they move on to, to international fame and fortune. I, th- I think I think ultimately, uh, when I've asked Ash this question, he would like to, to, to yeah. move on and do other things, and particularly Australian supercars. He'd yeah. love to have a go at the supercars. Um, and, and he's already had a taster of a supercar. But what he... What he said to me, and I I totally get this, he said, I don't want to equal other people's records. I want to win more (laughs) of everything than anyone else. And when I've done that, I'm quite happy to move on and do something But that will take him 10 years, though. It'll, it, so how many, how many wins be... Plato's got 98 or something so he's going to take he's got another he's got a, he's about 35 I think Ash he's going to have another I, 70 races I reckon what he's looking at is titles so well, who's um, got the most then so he's got the most along with Colin Turkington and Andy Rouse they've, they've all got four titles mm. five titles potentially for Ash next year who knows yeah but then he um, can't leave because Turks is still there he might get five because <laughs> because Colin is still there so uh, you've, got, you've got to hedge your bets at some stage haven't you oh I don't know with these records I mean look at the trouble with Lewis trying to get his eighth title I, mean, I, know, I don't know how much know. does it really matter in the yeah. end I know people like those records but uh, I just think I think because I went off and did my group C sports cars and I raced all over the world you know and you had a good time yes yeah. and I look yeah. but I didn't earn much money you know I'm, I'm yeah. well off you know but that was mainly from the television work you know yes yeah you know yeah. I raced in Japan I won the Bangalore Grand Prix in India you know I've raced <laughs> at Macau I've done the wow. 24 hours of um, 24 hours of Daytona around the bank I've done the streets <laughs> in Miami you know and, I'm so happy. I look at Grand Prix drives, in fact, sometimes and almost feel sorry for them that now they don't do any other racing and they yeah, just zoned yeah. in to go into those same Grand Prix circuits, yeah. huge yeah. security, crowds, yeah. the same uh, pressures. And yet I had this wonderful tour in the world, which is what I value most you know, out of, out of the racing career I had. So that's why I want them to move on as well. You know, I mean, Darren Turner's the sort of me of the past. You know, there's Oliver Gavin. He's sort of retired now. But a lot of the Brits, you know, to get out and have this... Um, a wonderful careers. What's up? What's our Porsche boy, Jack? Um, oof, the Porsches won the championship, didn't win the championship, won the most race, but he's out trying to move out, you know, get around the world and get a, a sports car contract. So um, that's what I'd like to see Ash doing. I think it'd yeah. be a shame if he just stayed bouncing around in touring cars well, for five years. Well, if it's all right years. with you, Tiff, we'll keep you in the, in the BTCC for a few years more because we haven't had enough of him yet. We love there him. There's yeah, lots of new names. No, you can have new names about now. I'm not sure what you... The cars are becoming more scientific and more important, a bit of a yes. touring car problem. Um, it used to be what I pulled, used to call a bit contrived, which Alan Gow hates, the word contrived, but, you know, the, the, all the engines having little tweaks and rumours and the weight being added. and So... I think it worked, the weight weight penalty. Never have it in the top level of Formula 1 or, or world sports cars. But I think the weight penalty worked because it made quite a big difference because your championship yes, leader yeah, could qualify yeah. 15th or 16th for the next yeah. race until you yeah. lost the weight. Yeah. Now they've used the boost, which isn't really effective enough as an overtaking tool. It seems to help a fraction. That, the, the, the hybrid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we've, we've sort of been dominated really by what's half a dozen cars and drivers most of the season. Not many you know, surprise winners apart from the reverse grid races that come out. So they're talking about increasing the boost, I think, next year to make maybe that surge of power a bit more. But to be able to make the most of the hybrid, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, yeah, it's sure getting very, twins. you know, yeah. BMWs and Fords. So that's the six cars in the top six places, and then you've got obviously Tom doing an amazing job in the in the one off yeah. Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai. Yeah. So there hasn't been that much variety at the front of the field, which is a small problem, less overtaking as well so that there used to be without that sort of difference. So. I'm got sure to be careful. Be, got to be there'll careful. be tweaks before next year, Tiff. I'm sure there'll be <laughs> meetings and tweaks taking place before the championship next year. <laughs> but they've done an amazing job with that Napa racing. 
haven't they just? Yeah, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. the red, the, the red bull of, of touring cars, really. But it's, but you know, Dan Camish <laughs> hasn't had, you know, so. Dan hasn't had the same sort of success. You know, Dan and he's a top rate. top yeah, driver. Yeah, I know, top yeah. top driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tiff, just before we let you go, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I believe congratulations is in order as well to you because you've had a partnership with Thruxton. We talk about control. You yeah. know your way around there very well, don't you? <laughs> According to our stats, this year you took your 8,000th passenger. Yeah. I mean, that is remarkable. You could drive that place in your sleep. <laughs> well, it's a lovely thing I do because, of course, you know, I was a good man. You know, then Goodwood was shut down in 1966 when I was there for the last race. You know, so that I lost my spectator circuit. And then, of course, the BRC moved. Um, so my dad had moved from Brooklyn to Goodwood, and now he moved from Goodwood to Thruxton. And I was on the fence up at the complex on that first Formula Two International, you know, watching Ronnie Peterson and Graham Hill, and still dreaming of a racing drive. You know, I was 15 years old, and so I was at Thruxton for the first international. And they used to go and watch at Thruxton, so it became my local home circuit, as it were. And then, of course, you know, winning the Formula Four, all of a sudden racing at Thruxton, and that goes on and on. Uh, and now, yes, you know, we had this opportunity 10 years ago. I had this idea, you know, when I was a BMW ambassador in those days and said, well, why don't we do some passenger rides for fun? And it just took off. And uh, the school now, as I said, 10 years, we've been running these passenger rides on their on their uh, performance days, on, their, on the school days. Not called a school anymore, is it now? It's more experience days. Yeah, yes. experience yeah. days. Yeah. And, uh, yes, we do this three laps yeah. of trucks and you, I'll, I'll take – Four-year-olds on booster seats and 84-year-olds on Zimmer frames. We'll <laughs> stick them in a passenger seat, turn on the camera, three laps. They oh. can laugh, scream, cry. I don't care what they're doing. And um, I bet you've seen it all, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, but it's and it's it's never nobody's ever been disappointed. I did I did my eight thousandth ride this year, wow. which is like twenty-four thousand laps of trucks and how many miles it is. But it, it's a wonderful day out. It's and it, the circuit's so good because oh. this is why I explain when I welcome people to trucks and them talk about I was there watching Graham Hill that the track hasn't changed. So the no. racing line. Yeah. The, the experience people drive is the same racing line exactly that Graham Hill drove yeah. off, you know. So, so, so it's a great circuit. It's safe, and we can get people driving Ferraris 120 miles an hour, as long as they're obeying instructors. And so, it's it's a wonderful place for these experience days. And I've just we have been a, hard, a part of it now for for 10 years. And I mean, the, the most amazing, the, the most common result is that people just cannot believe what a road car can do. I know it's a sports, yeah. you know, it's a sports saloon, yeah. a M2, BMW, but they cannot believe what a car does and the way I can throw it from lock to lock and tires smoking. And but um, a lot of scream. There was a, the, the favourite one was this Yorkshire lady, and she was about an eighty-four year old, and I think her daughter had bought this ride for her for some mad reason, and went straight into the complex summit. And she was, oh, 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 uh, so I'm looking across, and, <laughs> and then she breathes in again. <laughs> and then, and then she went, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> so we did these three laps with her chuckling away and breathing a bit. And when we got to the end and parked up, you know, the, the daughter came up to the door and she said, Oh, Chuck, that's the best thing I've done in my life. <laughs> And this was an 80 Brilliant. year old. No greater compliment than an 84 year old woman saying that's the best thing she's done in her life. Oh, so, uh, fantastic. Yeah, oh, people do enjoy doing it. So, oh, long yeah. may it continue. There's three more days this year, then not back again until next, uh, next March, February, March. It's on my bucket list, Tiff. I well, I'll give it. you yeah. one for free, Alan. You can come along. I'll give <laughs> you a free s- three laps. What a star you are. Out. It's my favourite circuit, Tiff, anywhere in the well, world. Well, it flows the race, yeah. you know. The other great story I have, one more, one more, one more final story, is that um, the Lotus 69 that I won in the magazine competition, I had my first race win at Thruxton in 1972. Sold it in 1973 to Austria. Another whole story, but that's a car parks and cash exchanging story. <laughs> Thought it had gone forever, heard it crashed a few times. In about 2012, I think, so I met someone on the holiday and said, I've got your Lotus 69. I said, well, you can't have it. It's a bent, twisted chassis that I sold, you know. But it had been brought back in bits and pieces, and um, uh, Simon Simon Thingy, the restorer, Hadfield, he'd had it oh, up, and yeah. he noticed the chassis number and the gearbox number, and they were my chassis number. The only oh, wow. part of the car that was original was the chassis plate and the gearbox. Um, and a few people raced it. Dan Collins owned it, and he kept on saying, you'll have to buy it off me, Tiff. And I said, I need cash. No, I don't want to it. And eventually, about 20... 14 i think i bought it back yes restored yes. it completely to its colors as it was when i won it 
And then doing the historic pre-72 Formula Ford Championship, which is a wonderful but entry-level motorsport. If you want to be a yeah, single-seater yeah. driver, go and race in historic Formula Fords. Anyway, I won a race at Thruxton. So same driver, same circuit, how many years apart? From 72 to 2014. So that's like 40 years gap. Same driver, same car, same circuit, winning a race. How that's really? that's got to be a Guinness Book of Records, doesn't it? That so <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> that was quite right? special to win again at Thruxton in my Formula Ford. I should say, uh, Tiff, it has been an absolute pleasure. In my pleasure. Yes. <laughs> and when we started, I said we could we could fill hours of conversation. We could. We've only just tickled the surface. <laughs> so I think we'll get you back on the Barking Man. Well, part two. Okay. I think I think part two and three, all of it coming up. Uh, but for now, Tiff Nadell, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to talk to you. Thank you. Cheers, Alec. Well, Alan, that's sadly all we've got time for an edition of Barking Mad. I'm sure you agree. It's been another cracking episode. <laughs> it absolutely has, Ian. But before we go, there's still time to tell you all about our fantastic sponsors, BP Fleet Solutions UK, who allow you to invest less on fuel and more on winning. The BP Plus fuel and charge card can be used at 3,400 locations. And don't forget, the card can be used by anyone. So if you're filling up team trucks, heading to a circuit as a spectator, or aiming for victory on track, there's a saving to be made on standard and ultimate grade fuels. Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't signed up for the BP Fleet Solutions card yet, then do head to www.bp.com forward slash BARC, where you can find all the information on this exclusive offer. Uh, if you need help, uh, just hit the call back button on the website and the BP Fleet Solution UK team member will be in contact with you. So, Alan, where are, we, uh, where are you going to be over the next couple of weeks? Um, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so this coming weekend i'm not working um i, I i've got a weekend off which is quite rare because i've got a busy november and pretty busy december yeah. as well so um scheduling in uh, weekends off is an important thing and i am going as a passenger i am so excited about this as a passenger on a tractor run around no. sussex and hampshire i am yeah a tractor in one of these run. A, a tractor run yeah explain explain more so a tractor run yeah so it, it's a it's it's an annual event i don't know much more about it but um hundreds of tractors all go um one after another vintage tractors state-of-the-art tractors um uh, go around the streets there's a, a fixed route starts from a farm and then heads around all the the families and kids come out and wave to the tractors as they go by. Um, and I uh, naturally have um, uh, been a little bit lucky, a little bit jammy. And I'm wow. in one of the sort of state of the art, oh. big, modern, huge bits of machinery. I know. I can't wait. It's, it's something I've never done before and I can't uh, wait. Yeah, I'm going to have to say. It is all right, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I thought that was the last <laughs> thing you expected me expecting to say, that. wasn't it? Uh, I, I'm going to be doing quite a bit of yeah. football. Right now. I've got four <laughs> games in eight days coming up. So if anybody's heading to Barnet or Farnborough or Haven't uh, wow. or Boreham Wood, please let me know. Because I'd, uh, wow. you know, let me know if you go to a ground. Uh, I'll probably be there. Uh, right now, we will be back in two weeks' time for our penultimate episode of the series. But if you can't wait until then, don't forget that every episode of the Barking Mad podcast is available to listen on all good podcasting platforms as well as the barc youtube channel if you do watch it there just remember to hit that little subscribe button as well so you don't miss any of the action including the live motorsport action that we bring you as well the barc website and social media channels are also the place to go if you're after the latest news reports and updates from inside the club uh right alan that's it we're done for another week uh, we'll see you all in a fortnight's time for more barking mad fun until then goodbye everybody